Have you ever stopped to wonder where does all the water on Earth come from and where does it go? Let's dive right into the mysteries of Earth's water systems. Picture this, a droplet of water. Seems simple, right? But you see, it's not just a droplet, it's a world traveler, shapeshifter, and life sustainer all rolled into one. On Earth, water exists in three states, solid, liquid, and gas. Yes, the same water that forms the vast oceans also makes up the fluffy clouds in the sky and the frost on your window on a chilly morning. It's everywhere, really. The distribution of water on Earth is rather lopsided. Over 70% of our planet is covered with water, but here's the kicker. Of all that water, only about 2.5% is fresh. The rest, my friends, is as salty as a pirate's attitude. Now let's talk about the circulation of water, or as the scientists like to call it, the water cycle. It's a never-ending journey, really. Water evaporates from the surface, forms clouds, falls back as rain or snow, and the cycle repeats. It's like the Earth's own personal recycling system. The conditions under which water exists are as varied as the landscapes of our planet. From the freezing temperatures of the polar ice caps to the scorching heat of desert regions, water is there in one form or another. But, you know what's fascinating? Even with all this water around us, we're still learning new things about it every day. It's a testament to the complexity of our planet and the intricate systems that keep it humming along. So the next time you take a sip of water, remember, it's not just H2O. You're partaking in a millennia-old cycle, one that's central to life as we know it. Water. It's more than just what fills your water bottle. It's a complex system that keeps our planet alive. Ever heard of a watershed? No, it's not a shed that holds water. Let's dive into the fascinating world of watersheds and their critical role in managing and planning our water resources. So, what's a watershed? Think of it as a gigantic bathtub, but instead of rubber duckies floating around we have lakes, rivers, and streams. When it rains the water doesn't just randomly scatter, it follows the natural contours of the land flowing into the nearest water bodies. This area of land that catches rain and snow, directing it into a network of waterways, is what we call a watershed. Now, you might be wondering, why are watersheds so important? Well, they're vital for managing and planning our water resources. Watersheds help us predict where water will go when it falls as rain or snow. They also help us understand how our water systems can be affected by things like pollution, deforestation, and climate change. Let's look at it this way. Imagine you're at a party, and someone spills punch on the table. It's going to flow down, right? Now, if you knew the shape of the table and the location of the spill, you could predict where that punch is going to end up. That's exactly what we do with watersheds. But watersheds aren't just about predicting water flow. They're also about protecting our water sources. Everything that happens in a watershed can affect the water quality downstream. So, if there's pollution in one part of the watershed, it can end up in our rivers and lakes. So, you see, understanding watersheds is a big deal. They're not just about the water that we see, they're about the water that we don't see the water that's underground, and the water that's yet to fall from the sky. They're about how we manage our most precious resource, and how we plan for the future. So next time you see a river or a lake, remember it's part of a much larger system called a watershed. Imagine an underground water world, that's essentially what a water table is. It's a hidden realm where water fills the spaces between rocks, sand and gravel, creating a natural underground reservoir. But just like the surface world we know, this underground water world isn't immune to human activity and natural phenomena. Let's start with human activity. When we overpump groundwater for agricultural, industrial, or domestic use, we can cause the water table to lower. Picture this. A glass full of pebbles, with water filling the spaces in between. If we keep sipping from this glass without giving time for it to refill naturally, eventually, we'll hit the bottom. That's what happens to the water table when we extract more water than it can recharge. Now consider construction projects. When we pave over natural ground for roads, buildings, or parking lots, we reduce the surface area that can absorb rainwater. This rainwater, which could have replenished the underground reservoir, now ends up in drains, rivers, or evaporates back into the atmosphere. Moving on to natural phenomena. Droughts, for instance, can drastically affect the water table. With little to no rainfall, the underground water world has no way to refill its stores. On the contrary, during periods of heavy rain, the water table may rise, sometimes leading to flooding. Climate change, too, plays a significant role. With rising temperatures, evaporation rates increase. More water evaporates from the soil and water bodies, leading to a drop in the water table. But why should we care? Well, changes in the water table can lead to a range of problems, 
from drying up of wells and reduction in water supplies, to land subsidence and even saltwater intrusion in coastal areas. So the next time you water your lawn, think about how it might be affecting our hidden underground water world. Each drop counts, and every action we take can have far-reaching impacts on this secret, life-sustaining reservoir beneath our feet. What happens when the earth gets a fever? Ice melts. Just like how you and I might break out in a sweat when we're under the weather, the earth has a similar reaction. But instead of sweat, it's the glaciers and polar ice caps that start to melt. It's the Earth's way of telling us that something's not quite right. Climate change is one of the biggest culprits behind this. It's like the Earth's bad flu that just won't go away. As the Earth's temperature rises, it heats up the atmosphere. This warmth is absorbed by the ice, causing it to melt at an accelerated pace. It's like leaving an ice cream cone out in the sun. You wouldn't expect it to last very long, would you? But there's more to it than just a warmer planet. Other factors like ocean currents and wind patterns also play a role in this chilling reality. Picture this. You're at the beach on a windy day, and the wind is blowing your beach umbrella away. Now imagine that on a much larger scale. These winds can carry warm air to the poles contributing to the melting. Now you might be wondering, what's the big deal? So, a little ice melts, that's not so bad, right? But here's the thing. When ice melts, it turns into water. This water then flows into our oceans, causing sea levels to rise. This can lead to coastal flooding and even the loss of land. It's not just about the water though. The melting ice also has an impact on our local and global water systems. It can disrupt the balance of freshwater and saltwater, affect our weather patterns, and even lead to a loss of habitats for animals like polar bears and penguins. So, the next time you're enjoying a warm sunny day, remember that our planet might not be feeling the same way. It's up to us to help cool things down and make sure our Earth stays healthy. After all, we're all in this together. We might love our warm weather but our planet not so much. Did you know bodies of water can change the weather? It's not magic, it's science. Now you may be wondering, how does water, the same stuff you drink and bathe in, influence our atmosphere? Well it all comes down to a little thing called evaporation. This is when water from the Earth's surface, like oceans, lakes and rivers, gets heated up by the sun and turns into water vapor. This water vapor then rises up into the atmosphere. Now this isn't some random journey, it's part of a grand process known as the water cycle, and it's incredibly vital to our planet's atmospheric conditions. You see, as this water vapor rises and cools, it transforms back into liquid water, creating clouds in the process. But here's where things get really interesting. These clouds don't just decorate our skies with fluffy shapes for us to daydream about. They play a crucial role in regulating our planet's temperature. You see, clouds reflect sunlight back into space, helping to cool the Earth. At the same time, they also trap some of the Earth's heat, providing an insulating effect. However, the influence of water doesn't stop there. Bodies of water also have a profound effect on local weather patterns. For instance, during the day, land heats up faster than water. This causes the warm air above the land to rise, and the cooler air from over the water rushes in to replace it, creating a sea breeze. At night, the process is reversed. The land cools faster than the water, causing the warmer air over the water to rise and the cooler air over the land to rush in to replace it, creating a land breeze. That's right. Water has the power to create wind. It's like a natural air conditioning system, providing relief on hot days and contributing to the unique climates we find around the world. So, the next time you enjoy a cool breeze by the ocean, thank the water for that. Ever wondered how clean your tap water is? There's an index for that. Now, to assess water quality, we don't just give it a sip and call it a day. Oh no, we have a whole range of indicators that we look at. First up, we have physical indicators. This includes temperature, color, and turbidity. Turbidity, in case you're wondering, is just a fancy word for how clear the water is. The cloudier the water, the higher the turbidity. Next, we have chemical indicators. These involve testing for substances like pH levels, dissolved oxygen, and various pollutants. If your water is too acidic or too alkaline, it could indicate a problem. Similarly, if there's not enough oxygen dissolved in the water, it can affect the aquatic life that depends on it. And of course, we don't want any nasty pollutants in our water, do we? Last but not least, we have biological indicators. This involves looking at the types of organisms living in the water. If there are too many harmful bacteria or algae, it's a sign that the water isn't as clean as it should be. Now the fascinating part is this. All these indicators are affected by human activity. For instance, 
Industrial waste can increase the level of pollutants in the water. Overuse of fertilizers in agriculture can lead to excessive nutrients, causing harmful algal blooms. Even our day-to-day -day activities like washing our cars or disposing of household chemicals can impact water quality. So you see, maintaining water quality isn't just about keeping our water tasty and clear, it's also about ensuring a healthy ecosystem for aquatic life and preventing potential health risks for us humans. And let's not forget, clean water is a finite resource. With the growing global population and the impacts of climate change, it's more important than ever to keep a close eye on our water's cleanliness. So, clean water isn't just about taste, it's about a lot of factors that we need to keep in check. How does water get from the clouds to your kitchen tap? Let's find out. The journey of water from nature to your tap is a fascinating and complex process. It all starts with precipitation, when water falls from the sky, as rain, snow, or hail. This water then flows over the ground and collects in rivers, lakes, and underground aquifers. But before it can be piped into your home, it needs to be treated to ensure it's safe for consumption. The first step in this process is coagulation. Here, chemicals are added to the water to bind together the small particles of dirt and other contaminants, forming larger particles called flocks. Next comes sedimentation, where these flocks settle at the bottom of the water supply due to their weight. This process is followed by filtration, where the clear water on top is passed through layers of sand, gravel, and charcoal to remove any remaining microscopic particles and bacteria. The final step is disinfection. This involves adding chemicals, usually chlorine, to kill any remaining bacteria or viruses. This process is crucial as it ensures the water is safe to drink. Now the water is ready to be delivered to your home. It's pumped into a network of pipes which are often buried underground. These pipes transport the water to your local area, where it's distributed to individual households through smaller pipes. But the journey doesn't end here. To maintain the water supply, municipalities must carefully manage water usage. This involves monitoring water levels in local reservoirs and enforcing water restrictions when necessary. It also includes maintaining the infrastructure, like pipes and treatment plants, to ensure the water can be delivered efficiently and safely. This entire process from nature to your tap is a marvel of modern engineering. It ensures that we have access to clean, safe water every time we turn on the tap, something we often take for granted. So the next time you open your tap, remember the long journey that water has taken to get to you. So, we've taken quite a journey today, haven't we? We've traveled through the mysterious and vast world of Earth's water systems, discovering its hidden secrets and understanding its crucial importance. We started by identifying the states of water on Earth's surface and understanding their distribution and circulation. We learned that water exists in three states, solid, liquid, and gas, and its constant movement and transformation is what we call the water cycle. Our journey then led us to the mighty watersheds, the drainage basins that collect all the water within a given area. We understood their significance in water management and planning. Like a water savings account, watersheds ensure we have a steady supply when we need it. We also delved into the nature's underground reservoirs and how they are impacted by human activity and natural phenomena. We found out that the water table, the upper level of groundwater, can fluctuate due to various factors, including our own actions. From there, we moved to the chilling reality of melting glaciers and polar ice caps. We identified the factors contributing to this phenomenon, including climate change and discussed its effects on local and global water systems. We then explored how bodies of water can change our atmospheric conditions. From creating local microclimates to influencing global weather patterns, water's effect on the atmosphere is truly profound. Our journey then took a deep dive into water quality. We described various indicators of water quality and explained how human activity can negatively impact them. Like a mirror, water reflects our actions, and it's up to us to ensure it reflects a positive image. Lastly, we learned about how municipalities process and manage water usage. From nature to our taps, the journey of water is a complex process that ensures we have clean, safe water to use. So, we encourage you to continue learning about Earth's water systems. Get involved, spread awareness, and do your part in protecting our precious water resources. Remember, every drop counts. So, let's make them count for something good.